can you speak yet? I'm not going to hit as many uh, mitigation policy issues. I'm going to talk more about the community process that I think needs to enable and provide a foundation for a lot of those messages. Um, so the communication, the, uh, speaking to receptive audiences, decision making are things that I'm going to talk about. I'm uh, Matt Campbell. I'm with FEMA headquarters and the national coordinator for the community planning capacity building recovery support function. It's a, it's a mouthful, but it was created uh, under the National Disaster Recovery Framework to focus on that role of the community, local government, local leaders, in better managing, better planning, better implementing recovery. Um, so if we're looking about ways that we can influence communities to make better choices, and it's not necessarily just better choices for mitigation, but to factor in the economics. I think that's a lot of the equation up here. To be able to, to digest those things, we have to think about, you know, why are they not able to? I, you know, I think there's a lot of influences that make it difficult for them, but often folks are frustrated with, well, why is that community making a bad decision? They should do it right, you know, uh, and, and there are sanctions and things like that. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of folks uh, folks in this room, and I that's all Jennifer Dunn back there. There she is. See? She's, she's trying to help communities make the right decision in the Silver Jackets program by uh, engaging with them. So what what am I looking at, and what, I, what do I think is important for us to develop programs and build resources and support? It's really look at that, that local government role, local officials, local staff, local leaders uh, are not necessarily government, but business leaders as well. Do they understand the role that they could play? Do they understand when they should act and how they can act? So looking at what, what's, what's needed to be successful at that local level, and then how can we influence it? Been a lot of talk about resiliency. Uh, talked to a couple of people. I mean, I have my own frustration about the definition. You know, a lot of people throw the word resiliency out, and I think if, generally when we're in the mitigation crowd, it's often a substitute for physical resiliency. But we we get confused when we're talking about that that other part too, the social, organizational, political, leadership, how communities function part. Um, and I think without that first part. Uh, it's hard to get to the second part. It's hard for communities to make the right decision if they don't really have those other components functioning well. And this is the the Rockefeller City Resilience Framework uh, diagram that was shown in the other session. I don't know if mine's able to be read or not, but uh, you can see that the big, the four outer categories: health and well-being, economy, society, infrastructure, and environment, and then up there, leadership and strategy. I wanted to focus on the, the leadership and strategy part. But I think that's the part that you know really influences the rest of them. I would actually, I, I have actually have my own diagram that I created a long time ago where I have that in the center, and you've got all these issues around because that has to be what is is really enabling that local process. So they've got effective leadership and management, powered stakeholders, integrated development plan. Effective leadership and management is really only effective if they if they if they're empowered by stakeholders, and if they really want to do some serious work, they're going to need to do some integrated development planning. Um, and I think we can trace a lot of the, the challenges to that. Um, the the influence of external policy, uh, the influence of, of good communication. I, I think if you don't have receptive leaders, if you don't have an educated or capable uh, customer, your messages get lost or Mis misconstrued. So I think it's it's a slightly different way of approaching some of what Ed was talking about. Um, when I'm talking about the things that we're looking at supporting, I've had my own way of categorizing, but it's basically the same. We're looking at leadership, planning, and the various elements of planning. How do communities make decisions? That's what plan planning is about. Community engagement, and then recovery management. I'm focused in the post-event period for the most part. I started out as a mitigator and have seen a lot of uh, challenging, challenging situations and many, many missed opportunities in the post-event period. I started working in the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, which the, the genesis for that is to take advantage of the willingness of communities to, to act and correct things after disaster. So you know, one, of the, one of the challenges is making sure we're enabling communities to do the right thing. Uh, you know, you're at the state level, I'm sure you've seen You'd like to fund better projects, but you know, uh, some communities 
they're, they've got something up with how do we how do we get to those communities to help them make, make better decisions um, is it uh, placing more requirements on them uh, is it putting giving them more money I think it's, it's common about we've been throwing more and more money at it do we need to spend more money or do we need to spend it smarter I think we need local governments to, to, to do that um, and I'm not just saying they should do it I'm, I'm trying to talk about what can we look at in our various programs to help a community be able to adapt, adapt and act after disaster. We can talk about this before disaster as, as well. Again, that concentrated time frame and the complexity of the recovery phase is we, we miss huge opportunities. We just reinforce what we had before and in many cases make it worse by building a new facility and a little bit of mitigation maybe because it's required. But I, I think in those situations, is community resilient? Well, let's let's have a disaster and see how they're able to bring their effective leadership and management together in conjunction with their stakeholders and actually go through some planning and solid decision making. It's tough, and there's not much in the way of support to do that. The community planning capacity building recovery support function, again, is, is meant to try and bring folks together that want to or can play in that space, and many folks don't realize how they can play in that space. Recovery especially at the startup. You've all seen those, I, I, I was going to, but I didn't have a chance to do this. Uh, you know, those, those little diagrams, where's my whiteboard? Uh, <laughs> those diagrams that show the trajectory of the community. You know, what's influencing in that early phase, the trajectory going up? More money, more requirements, more demands? Uh, I think it's a lot of these things that uh, communities start chasing the funding, they start reacting to public demands. Um, so what can we do to help them get organized before a disaster, or if they haven't, come in and support them so that they're not fractured? Uh, what can we do to help them communicate? Which direction does the community want to want to head in? We've seen, well, I, I, I don't know in Tulsa, the question is in Tulsa, was, was, there, le was there leadership? Yeah. Community figures that stood up afterwards said, yeah. we've, got to, we've got to fix this. So, you know, it's not real very resilient. If there isn't someone that is either official or unofficial, who can help those people emerge? Who can support those people at that time by giving them the confidence they need? You know, who, who can help with the motivation? I think a lot of what Ed was talking about, some of it's a little scary, but um, <laughs> in terms of the consequences, but help, help to motivate them to, to be able to take action. And acting quickly, uh, we see community stalling, not sure what to do. Sufficient human capital, uh, you know, working at the state level or working at, at, at a direct interface with local government. You've probably seen in the present day they, they have limited staff after disaster. Tax base devastated. Staff might be let go, and that's not very good for being resilient, and certainly not for being able to adapt that quickly. Um, then we've got some other things: our ability to manage the, the, the mechanics of local government. <coughs> And, and maintaining momentum, I think, has a lot to do with all those other things. You know, all the things that were mentioned in, in Tulsa and the things that we've seen in successful efforts, effective leadership, community engagement, all those things really help in that in that sphere. And so, where do we go at this point? You know, those are all lots, okay, you know, we, I think from a lot of the researchers we study, uh, oh, this is a problem, we we'll study it more and define more, what's the problem, what's the problem, what's the problem? maybe make some recommendations that are broad in policy. But I, I would like, and I think uh, Dr. Simbiedo's back there, maybe, yeah, there he is, hello. Some others, uh, to, to work with academic folks, practitioners, and others, and, and look at the key decision points. I think we already know about a lot of them. You know, the recovery ordinance that American Planning Association has, you know, the things in there are built on the experience of, of moratoriums and administering building codes. You know, those are some key decision points that communities fumble with after disaster. So that's a that's a piece of guidance or resource. Um, you know, who are the foot soldiers that, that can go out there and help educate communities to do that before or in many cases when they don't have that kind of thing, apply it after. And I don't know if the mitigation ambassador program is, is, is something that can be uh, mobilized after disaster, but yep. okay. Well maybe we could And before. Up. And before. Jury. All right. He's making a lot of promises right now. He can't. Can I say? Can. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, and then all of those 
problems and the gaps or challenges that communities face, uh, you know, what are the best strategies? So I think the research can help. What are the decision points and what are the effective ways? I heard in our presentations earlier um, about we found a good case study. Some, there was, there's a decision point problem. Somebody effectively addressed that. We've got to start pulling that stuff together and then making that available uh, before and interject it after the disaster. Um, and who? Well, we've already got the, the mitigation ambassadors. We've got Silver Jackets. We've got a number of other organizations. We've got American Planning Association with a new, with a new division that's trying to figure out how can we help communities with these kinds of things. And so what, what can we do now? Alliances and coordination. So I've mentioned all the names because I'm trying to build alliances and coordination. <laughs> mentioned guidance, tools, examples, training. I think we've got to pull the community of practice that resides in all the different professions. You know, it's city managers, it's it's planners, it's economic developers, it's mitigators, it's emergency managers, it's people that graduate with masters of public administration that do public policy. We've got to look at all of those areas, and then we've got to harness some of the resources. Uh, that are out there and the capabilities, which does relate to to the organizations. Um, you know, there's funding that comes in and is a, a, a shot in the arm. You know, well, the government's tax base is decimated. Uh, I, I don't know. Has anybody out here seen any considerable funding source to help local government maintain staffing, let alone ramp up staffing to deal with all that stuff? Uh, community involvement, planning, supporting leadership. I, there's mutual aid. And, you know, there's EMAC. Uh, but it doesn't really have a recovery capability, and, and probably as importantly, it doesn't have. It doesn't mean there's a funding source to pay for people to staff local government for a, a longer-term recovery operation. Um, funding resources come in. Uh, I'll use an example like in New York. New York did a good thing. They, they created the New York Rising Reconstruction Program. It, it heavily integrated risk. Worked with quite a few communities. It start till nine to twelve months after the disaster. That's when the CDBG money eventually made its way through the system, and when the state was able to get its, it, itself organized. So uh, Gavin Smith at the closing talked about the role of the state, and saw Governor Hunt saying governors need to do this. Well, governors need to also be ready to figure out how to support their local governments uh, after a disaster, uh, and, and you leverage the resources that are really there. And I think, like in Colorado. Uh, successful you know they have the Department of Local Affairs we engaged with them them pretty pretty early um, also did a good job of creating uh, programs the, the, the governor's office covering the resilience not that mean slightly wrong but we, we're finding more and more and more of uh, any sizable disaster the governors are, are ad hoc but still a good thing creating these recovery functions to deal with this complexity one thing that's lacking is getting to the support of the local government to enable better decision making. Um, it does happen, but we need to work on it. So the resources and the capabilities, the state level. Federal level, you know, I mentioned some partners in the room. And this is this happened to be just a graphic I could pull out of the word or my, uh, smart art. So the, the fact that certain organizations are listed with a piece of the pie, ignore that. I'm just trying to show that everybody's supporting those components, the leadership, the planning, the community engagement management at the local level. And there's many other organizations and agencies that can that can support. Do uh, many of those folks have as their mission supporting local leadership development? Mm, not necessarily, but many of them have a component of that. Uh, USDA funds the land grant universities. Uh, and most of them have a community development policy objective. And under that they often do community development leadership training. And we've successfully leverage that after disaster in some cases to help get in there. They already have relationships with, with a lot of those communities. They know how to go into those communities. So, you know, we actually use them in, in Greensburg. I mean, everybody's heard about Greensburg. We met with the rural development state director, you know, five days after the disaster. We were talking about ideas about repurposing that kind of training. So, you know, it starts early because the well, that, that mayor actually self-employed, the first mayor self-employed several weeks in the disaster because he was he was making all kinds of waivers to, to zoning and ordinance, feeling that he was supporting uh, what the community wanted until the community realized we can't have chaos in rebuilding. Um, that wasn't influenced by the community development leadership training. Um, so 
you know, I hope this has shed some some light on a different way we can approach it because I think all of the issues are thrown out there. Well, I, you know, how do we get involved in this grand policy sphere? There's a lot of ways to do that. There's also a lot of ways to work this problem at the bottom, um, as I think most folks in this room and, and all those agencies interface with and support local government. Try to influence local government. Anyone that's trying to influence local government probably has some program capability, resource training, uh, you know, guidance tool, funding source that could do that. So, as we look at programs, you know, we need to think of that broadly. So everyone's a mitigator. Everyone's a person that helps with community capacity building. I think. Um, I didn't want to make it a, as uh, too much of a commercial community planning capacity building. I really wanted to talk about the essence of you know, the, the problem and the challenge we're trying to address. Um, but I will we'll put out there um, for folks that have ideas about who could participate in supporting those areas, I, I welcome it. You know, our, our, our mission is, is really in those that lead, plan, manage, engage space, um, and really looking to coordinate and bring, bring folks together after disaster. Barry mentioned uh, in the session the other day, you know, Texas and Oklahoma. We're not quite engaged with uh, Texas yet, but we are involved in Oklahoma and we're going to be trying to work with uh, APA and some of the other organizations to get around the table. I was talking to the state mitigation officer uh, yesterday, you know, discussing possibilities. States, states have found a little, a little, little overwhelmed now with a lot of activity and that's what we're there for, is to work and strategize and help the state and help other organizations engage. So, uh, you know, perhaps it's good. I don't, I don't have a regulatory requirement, perhaps it's good I don't have funding because we're, we're about uh, coordinating and, and, and leveraging that downside. Okay, that's it? Yep. Thank you.